Okay, so there's a new model out that a lot of people are talking about on Twitter called Phi 1.5. And in this video, I want to go through a little bit about that model, but also I want to talk about the trend that's been leading up to this model. And this is the idea of having a small model with a heavily curated data set to get a much better result out of this. So for example, we know that models like GPT-4, Palm, even the previous GPT-3 models were trained on immense amounts of data. Certainly the newer ones trained on a lot more data. Even Llama 2 we know is trained on 2 trillion tokens plus the various fine tuning tokens, etc. And we know that works, especially if you've got a really big model. The question is though, is a lot of that training just being wasted, repeating like the same lessons to the model again and again and again. So what I wanted to do in this video was just look at a number of papers and then we'll sort of end on Phi 1.5 that have led us in this direction that I think are interesting. And then I'll even look at some of the controversy around Phi 1.5 in here. So the first one that I would talk about is a paper called Tiny Stories. So this came out back in April. It's a really interesting idea from Microsoft Research. And it is very interesting also that a lot of this research is being led by Microsoft Research and actually being published. And considering that Microsoft has a deal with OpenAI, it's very interesting that their researchers are actually going in the opposite direction of trying to go for small models with better data rather than the huge models like OpenAI are doing. So Tiny Stories came out and the idea here is very simple. They start off with these tiny little models and they're basically just trying to train them to be able to create sort of tiny stories, right? Like children's stories. So there are a number of ideas that have been proposed around this paper and with discussions around this paper that relate to, you know, a child can learn to speak and make basic stories and stuff with only the equivalent of a few billion tokens. So why is it that these models need hundreds of billions, if not trillions of tokens to be able to learn to do the same thing? So the idea here is that they start with a really small model. They make a bunch of these sort of tiny stories and they trained up models to be able to do this. And the results from this are really promising. I encourage you to go and have a look at the model itself. I'm pretty sure for this, they've actually released the data set now as well that you could look into and try it out. But the paper really does raise some really interesting questions of that maybe we don't need these huge models as much as we think we do. We just need really nice, well-chosen data and the idea of curated data. Another paper that came out after this, which sort of also looked heavily into the curated data aspect, is the model Orca. And so I'm cutting this paper short with just very brief explanation of sort of some of the things in the paper here. The cool thing here is that, again, they're looking at how do we curate data and perhaps how do we use synthetic data to train some of these models, to train small models that can get results similar to the big models like a GPT-4, like a chat GPT, etc. So the cool thing with this paper is that they talked a lot about actually how they created the data set. And that led to a lot of people uh, making open source data sets. Unfortunately, Microsoft, as far as I know, till today still hasn't released the data set that they used for training the Orca model. But the idea here is that you're looking at a 13 billion parameter model that can achieve well above its weight. You know, let's just say like that. And that it brings it into comparison with GPT-4, with chat GPT, etc. So the sort of formula that they talk about in this paper was used to create a number of the open Orca data sets, which people have used to then fine tune some very nice llama models that actually can replicate, you know, quite a bit of this. So this was definitely a step in the direction of sort of curation data going for a smaller model as well. Another one, and this comes from some of the authors of the tiny stories, but from other people at Microsoft as well, that sort of was going in this direction was the paper called textbooks are all you need. And the idea here is they introduced this model that they call Phi one. And it's a tiny model. We're talking about like 1.3 billion parameters. So this is a model that's smaller than GPT-2 in here. And it's only trained for four days on 
eight A100s. So the training is not huge as well. But they talked about that, you know, this is trained mostly on what they call textbook quality data. The idea here is that they can get a model which can, you know, do very well on the human eval and on a number of these different benchmarks when compared in a similar light to models like Llama 2, to models like Falcon, to models like ChatGPT, GPT-4, etc. Now, I don't think they're outright saying for any of these models that they're better than GPT-4. What they're showing is that with a tiny model, if you give it the right data and you curate that data, perhaps you even use curriculum training in the right way, this is something that can lead to a much better result. So I touched on this in the Falcon 180, where I mentioned that I do believe that some of the big companies have some cool tricks around how they're training the models, how they're selecting the data and ordering the data in the way that they train the models. And I think some of these papers are getting at that. So this leads us up to the technical report that came out this week, which is Phi 1.5. And this is basically a sort of like an update or, you know, they're calling it textbooks are all you need to, and they go into it a bit more. And then for the first time now, they've released a model for this. So let, let's have a look at you know, this paper and have a look at the model behind it. Okay. So let's jump into the paper and have a look at what is actually going on here. So like I mentioned before, textbooks are all you need to is, is kind of be thought of as the third paper in this series with the tiny stories being the first one where they basically used a 10 million parameter model to train something that could speak sort of coherent English. Phi one being a 1.3 billion parameter model with the goal there of doing Python coding and getting close to uh, state of the art performance for that. And then this one being uh, Phi 1.5 where they're really focused on common sense reasoning in natural language here. So you'll see throughout the paper, this talk of textbook quality data. So the model that they've released has used basically a bunch of synthetic data that was generated from GPT-4 for this. So for the Phi 1.5, they actually use the data, the original 7 billion tokens from the Phi 1 model for kicking things off. But then they go on to develop a lot more data with GPT-4. And so some of the Phi 1 data was actually made with ChatGPT 3.5. Here they're using GPT-4 to manufacture a lot of the new data that they've got in here. So if we compare these models to say a Llama 7 billion parameter model, we can see that the amount of training time is way smaller than you know, what they actually had there. Not to mention the number of tokens is also a lot smaller. So the tokens here, we can see that for the Phi 1.5 billion model, just the basic one without the web stuff, was 150 billion tokens as compared to Llama's 7 billion's 1 trillion tokens in here. If we jump ahead, we can see that, you know, the architecture for this is actually pretty standard transformer stuff that really a lot of the key stuff in here is related to the training data. So they talk about Phi 1.5 combining the original 7 billion tokens from Phi 1 with a lot of this synthetic textbook like in inverted commas there data for roughly 20 billion tokens. So. The idea here is that they basically get GPT-4 to generate a whole bunch of different data in the style of textbooks for 20,000 topics that they've selected for seed generation. And they're using that to create this entire data set, which will train the model. And they point out here that the only non-synthetic part of the training data is actually what came from the Phi-1 data set in here. So one of the really disappointing things of this technical report is they don't give you the actual data set for one, and they also don't give you the prompts that they were using to create this textbook like data. You've got to think that would be pretty interesting for a lot of people who are trying to make fine tuning data sets, just like the Orca paper did describe a lot of how they made the data sets enough that people could start attempting to make their own open source versions of the data set for training. 
Unfortunately here, we probably don't have enough information to how they've actually done it. So the main claim here is to show that this synthetic data can actually do almost on par as much larger data sets that are out there by just training these small models that tend to perform roughly as good or if not better than models five to 10 X their size in here. And we can see with the common sense reasoning that they've gone for the, the straight phi 1.5 uh, is actually doing better than say a Vicuna 13B model here and actually doing better than the, the Llama 7 billion models here. So this is definitely interesting. One of the controversies around this though is has there been some kind of data leakage into their actual model set? So I'll look at a bit of the talk about that in a second, but we can see here that they've got their Phi 1.5 and the Phi 1.5 web. So remember the Phi 1.5 is just purely synthetic data plus the Phi 1 data, whereas uh, Phi 1.5 web is, you know, using more of a general sort of web curated data set. We can see that the purely synthetic data set does really well and matches up against models a lot larger with a lot bigger training sets for most of these particular skills in here. Okay, so like every hot paper that seems to be out at the moment, it must come with a Twitter controversy as well. And Phi 1.5 certainly doesn't let us down here. So the debate on Twitter has been whether this model is actually trained on some of the benchmarks that they've tested out here. So one of the people leading the case for that has been Susan Zhang, who was one of the lead people on training the OPT models from meta a while back and she makes uh, a case for this i think that a number of people have counted this case and actually some of the authors in a video talked a lot about how they looked for ways to check whether they had data leakage and whether they had information actually coming into the model from some of these sources now it could be the case that when you're creating so much synthetic data with a uh, gpt4 that it kind of knows what these data sets are. I think it's quite probable that perhaps GPT-4 has seen some of these data sets and some of these benchmarks before, and maybe it is able to create data that is similar to this. At the, in the end though, I think it really doesn't matter whether that's the case or not. I think benchmarks as a whole now are not as reliable in telling us how good a model is. We really have to try it out and we have to see that, okay, if it does have uh, this skill set from the GSM 8K. So remember this, I've talked about the GSM 8K data set in multiple videos. This is the grade school math data set. And if it has the skills to answer those questions, it's going to be useful, hopefully, for a variety of different things, not just for passing the benchmark in relation to this. So let's have a look at the code and jump in and see, okay, what can the model actually do by having a play with it ourselves? Okay, so to load the Phi 1.5 model, it's pretty simple. We're just going to use uh, transformers to bring it in. It does actually require that you trust remote code in here. They're doing a number of things in the background. So you need to, they're doing this configuration of a Mixformer sequential, which I'm not 100% sure what it is. I haven't had a chance to look into it yet, but it definitely requires that you trust the, the code in here for doing this. Then basically I'm just setting up a simple little function to go through this. Now, if we look at the code gen example, so this is one of their examples for printing all prime numbers, we can see that it generates code. And the interesting thing is that after each of these, so the authors actually talked about that the data set would sort of have a, a lesson and then would also have exercises that they would sort of use afterwards. So you'll see that it will actually print out this Python code with the sort of three ticks for markdown for how these models show code, etc. Then we've got the, the exercises after that, which, which is also kind of interesting in here. So I've asked it to do a simple one of just detect if a number is prime. And you can see it's, it, and I've told it to basically return true or false. It's gone through and basically written a function for doing that. So that's the code part of it. Try it out and see 
what works for you, what doesn't work for you. I'd be very interested to see in the comments if people sort of spot patterns in here. Then they have instruction answering. Now remember that this model is not fine-tuned. It's not uh, RLHF'd in any way. So it's not even sort of made for doing instruction answering. But we can see this sort of question and answer stuff. It can come back with some decent results. Now, because it, it just keeps generating afterwards, though, for these. So there are a number of those. It can also do chat, which, again, this is not fine-tuned for doing chat, like the Llama 2 chat model or something. This is just out of the box. This model is like this. So people are starting to fine-tune this for specific results to see, okay, how does it actually stand up in this case? Anyway, so the, the one that I was most interested in was just trying out some of the GSM 8K things in here. So you can see here that it's often on track. So this is a, a question basically about s selling cl clips. And you can see that, that it gets that, okay, you know, she sold half as many clips in May. So May should be April divided by two. And then the total of April plus there. So this is actually doing sort of the right PAL math, but it doesn't actually give us the answer out in there, which I'm pretty sure that would be considered wrong in the GSM 8K you know, tests that we've got there. And you can see this with a number of these ones that it gets the sort of thinking right, but doesn't always get to the right answer. Uh, here is another interesting one. So this is like a deep sea monster rises from the waters every hundred years to feast on the ship and sate its hunger. Over 300 years, it's consumed 847 people. Ships have been built larger over this time, so each ship has twice as many people as the last ship. How many people were on the ship that it ate in the first 100 years? So the thinking here is quite good, right? It's basically worked out that, oh, okay, each year it doubles, or each 100 years it doubles. So we've got X, and it even says, let's assume the number of people on the first ship is X. So the second year is twice that, 2X, and then 4X. So Quite simply, we've got 4x plus 2x plus x, right? So 7x, but then it jumps to 9x. So it's making sort of some of the standard mistakes that these things do of where it's done really well with sort of the thinking part of it, but actually it lets itself down on the simple arithmetic part of it here. So this maybe would have been better to generate it as a PAL output or something. Anyway, have a play with it yourself and see you know, how it goes, uh, what you sort of think about it. Leave some messages in the comments below if you've got anything uh, interesting that you notice for it. As always, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below. If you found the video useful, please click like and subscribe. I will talk to you in the next video. Bye for now.